Welcome. We're waiting for the room to populate. Thanks for joining us today. We'll begin in just a moment. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. We're glad you're here. Just going to give us a few more seconds to get the room populated and we'll get started in a moment. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. We will get started in just a moment. All right. It looks like our participants have I've populated the room. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to turn it over to Alejandro for a quick message about translation. If you need Spanish language translation, he's going to explain that now. Hello, thank you very much for having me and thank you for your patience as I provide these instructions in Spanish, everyone. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Alejandro Arrieta, seré su intérprete el día de hoy de El Español. Si usted prefiere escuchar en español Eh, después de las instrucciones todavía no, pero después va, va a haber un icono terráqueo o un icono de mundo que va a aparecer en la parte de abajo a mano derecha de su pantalla. Si usted ha ingresado a la reunión usando un dispositivo eh, como celular o tableta, por ejemplo, un dispositivo móvil, podrá tener acceso a esa interpretación en el menú con los tres puntitos que dice más o en inglés que dice more. De ambas maneras podrá seleccionar el español y poner el audio original en silencio justo después para que solamente escuche en el idioma de su preferencia. Si en algún momento tiene algún problema con la interpretación, por favor eh, avisar de por Por favor, avísenos y de ahí este, intentaremos ayudar lo más posible. Pero de ahí se lo voy a pasar a Gillian para comenzar con la interpretación. So now I'll pass it over to you, Gillian, to go ahead and turn on that interpretation. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to be putting the ADL code of conduct in the chat momentarily here. Um, we're, we're, we're glad you're spending time with us. Um, closed captioning is also provided on this webinar and Spanish language translation. Welcome and thank you for joining us for youth radicalization online and in gaming. What to watch for as your kids spend their summer on screens. I'm Jillian Bonke, ADL's Divisional Education um, Director for the Central Division. I have the privilege today to introduce you, uh, introduce to you our guides for today's webinars who have so much useful information um, and they each come to this conversation with a different background. So we are joined today by Danielle Bryant. She is ADL's uh, Education Director in Austin, Texas. She is a Formas Campus Administrator and Teacher. She lives in Austin and she's also a doctoral student at Texas State University. We have Dr. Laura Tribowitz. She is the ADL Midwest Education Director and Associate Director for National College and University Programs. She's a former university professor of English with expertise in 20th and 21st century anti-Semitism, racism, fascism, and neo-fascism. And we have Callum Farley, who is an investigative researcher with the Center on Extremism, where he monitors uh, neo-Nazi extremism with a particular focus on the accelerationist movement. He frequently represents ADL in briefings and trainings with law enforcement and community organizations. Prior to joining ADL, he completed his master's degree with honors um, from, I'm gonna get it right, maybe not, Masaryk University in the Czech Republic. Names matter, Colin. Will you fix it? Uh, Masaryk. You're Masaryk. Right. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, where he studied uh, non-state conflict and 
democratic initiatives. I will post our ADL code of conduct in the chat. Also reminders about closed captioning and Spanish language translation if you need additional directions on that in English. I'm gonna throw it to Laura now where we're gonna learn a lot about what to watch for as our students spend their summer on screen. Thank you so much, Jillian. Uh, just a few words about who we are, ADL formerly known as Anti-Defamation League, but we have rebranded ourselves, much like Prince, we're called ADL. We are one of the oldest anti-hate organizations in the US. We were founded in 1913 in Chicago. From the very get-go, we had a two-fold mission. Our founders um, directed us to fight anti-Semitism and to fight to protect the rights of the Jewish people. From the very get-go, we understood that if we were going to work to combat anti-Semitism, we had to be ready to fight all forms of bias, bigotry, and discrimination. That if we were going to work to protect the rights of the Jewish people, we had to be ready to protect the rights of all people. Today, that is at the heart of all the work we do, and in particular, at the heart of our education work. And before we dive in, I just really quickly wanted to mention that and acknowledge the recent events that we've seen, not only in Allen, Texas last week, but also now more recently yesterday in Farmington, New Mexico. And while we do understand the importance of these events and the effects they have on our communities, I just wanted to make it very clear that in the context of this webinar and this presentation, these are not topics that we'll be covering today. All the work that we do, we're very lucky to have the research expertise of a number of centers, including our Center on Extremism, uh, our Center on Technology and Society, where we do a lot of work on gaming, and we'll talk about some of their work today, our educational expertise, and the expertise of our civil rights team. One of our old acronyms we used to use frequently is PI. We protect, we investigate, and we educate. And one of the ways that we continue to educate is through our pyramid of hate. You'll notice as we're speaking today, we anchor a lot of our conversation in the different layers from biased attitudes all the way up to genocide. So I invite you to take a moment to look alongside the pyramid of hate with me as we start at the base with biased attitudes such as stereotyping or insensitive remarks. We make our way up to acts of bias, bullying and ridicule will fall under there through to discrimination, which includes educational discrimination, housing and segregation all the way to bias motivated violence, where we start to see vandalism, threats, arson, terrorism, up to genocide, which I'll take a moment just to read the definition of the act or intent to deliberately and systematically annihilate an entire people. Now, as we're talking about these extremist groups and youth radicalization online, it's important for us to remember that this happens anywhere within the pyramid of hate. It's not a vacuum, but it can happen ongoing. Next, we anchor all of our education work in our anti-bias framework. So that is a pedagogy rooted in exploring identity, interpreting differences, challenging bias, and finally championing justice. But it's important to remember that you can't do these things, you can't get to championing justice without flexing that muscle. We must work together to explore our identities. We must value interpreting and understanding differences, challenging bias, and using that as a tool in our everyday lives to get to a place where we can champion justice going forward. Thanks, Danielle. Um, a number of these slides that we'll be showing and talking about today can be tough to see. So we do ask you to take a few moments, especially before you begin to talk about the uh, talk about the things we'll be discussing today with the young people in your life. Take a few moments to digest the information, to assess your own emotional response to what we'll be talking about and showing you today to do whatever uh, information gathering you need to do to be able to feel confident in your knowledge, your background knowledge about the signs and symbols that we'll be talking about. We do, uh, we will be talking about some best practices. Just know one quick caveat that none of what we're talking about constitutes legal advice. Thanks, Laura. And as we go forward with those specific learning objectives, as you may have seen on your registration, today we will be discussing ways to analyze extremist recruitment tactics, understanding the ways to talk with your child, learning how to intervene to help your child, and identifying resources to continue learning. So as we go throughout this webinar, you have the opportunity to put questions in the chat for us panelists, and at the end of the session, we'll be able to take some time to answer those. 
And you'll see as we're modeled throughout the entire webinar, we want this to be a discussion. We know that this is a conversation that parents and caregivers and educators alike are really eager to have. So we do invite you to put those questions in the chat. And so before we really dive in, I just want to provide everyone right now with a content warning. I did already see in the chat that one individual did ask if there's any images of violence shown. Um, and while there will not be any images of explicit violence, um, there are images that contain threats to certain communities and um, the symbology that is used by these extremist groups in their online spaces in their attempts to try to radicalize and recruit um, younger individuals. So why this? Why now? Well, this, this webinar was came out of a conversation with multiple parent groups in Austin and across the Central Division, conversations within the organization. Parents are concerned. Parents are worried. Caregivers are worried. They want to know how to be there for their children. What questions do I ask? What apps can my kids go on? What am I looking for? What are some of those warning signs? And we know that educators are seeing the consequences in their classrooms with students using misogynistic language, with making more violent threats, having more racially motiva motivated hate, and an increased rate of anti-Semitic hate as well. So while this first section may be difficult to hear and to see, it's important to understand the landscape as well. So this is not the experience of every child, but understanding that every child is vulnerable. And we'll talk more about that as we continue. Okay, and so to begin, just to give everyone an idea, this right here, these are all images that I personally have taken from the research that I'm doing day in and day out. Um, obviously, this is going to be on the more extreme angle of what I'm seeing, but at the same time, these are in all spaces. Um, and you can see whether it's the direct anti-Semitic threats, whether it's more veiled anti-Semitism, whether it's ideas of threatening violence through images, this is the kind of content that can be pretty easily found online. These are not from websites where you need to prove that you're over 18. These are not from spaces that are like very well moderated. And so this is just, you know, an introduction to give you an idea of the kind of content that I see. Um, and in some spaces, what pretty much anyone else can see as well. One of the goals of this webinar today is to begin to level set your knowledge around terms vocabulary. So we wanted to start briefly with two terms. First is a definition of extremism that we at ADL use. Extremism we define as an adherence to religious, social, or political belief systems that exist substantially outside of the belief systems that are more broadly accepted in society. Extremism is not necessarily the same thing as violent extremism. When we're starting to talk about violent extremism, what we're talking about is the advocating or engaging in preparing for ideologically motivated violence to further social and economic and political objectives. So when we're talking about extremism and violent extremism, we want to make sure that we are distinguishing between those two terms. One of the things that ADL does is to track incidents of white supremacist propaganda. We wanted to show you a couple of stats to see the kind of trends that we're seeing across the nation. We give you these numbers with the understanding or the caveat that these are underreported numbers. So we know in fact that the actual numbers may be higher. Here you can see the rates of increase from 2019 to 2020 to 2021. It started off in 2019 with about 2,700 incidents of reported propaganda had a almost 50% increase when we moved into 2020, and then a small decrease in 2021. But even when we were seeing that decrease, there was an increase about 27% of anti-Semitic uh, content in that messaging. 2022, we are again seeing an increase. We've moved up to over 6,500 uh, incidents of white supremacist propaganda. One of the concerns that we have and we know is shared by families and by educators is the intentional recruitment of young people. 2016, we know and we're tracking the intentional recruitment of young people on college campuses. We are now seeing manifestos where white supremacist groups are beginning to talk about 
the very intentional targeting of young people as young as 11 years old. So it is something we are concerned about and we are tracking, hence the reason for this webinar today. And to show you exactly what that looks like, um, here I have examples of two quotes from groups that I have monitored in chat spaces online. Um, for the first quote, you'll see that I did redact the name of the group just to not provide it with any sort of platform. But you can see that they talked about specifically focusing on doing more in real life activism, specifically because they know that they have a younger audience of mostly teenage boys. And so they know that for the movement, they want to convince these younger individuals to be able to go out and so instead of just staying on their computers, but doing things in the real world. Um, they also, you can see from the second quote, see the quote unquote neo-Nazi youth as being a very large and important part of you know, being able to try and succeed in creating their white supremacist worldview. Uh, we move to the next slide. Um, and then even looking at here, an individual who talks about how they were uh, radicalized into these spaces and how through repeated acts of being exposed to this sort of content, he mentioned how it slowly hammered hatred into him like a railroad spike into limestone. And I think this is really important because of the amount of content and information that there is online. It isn't going to be one instance of one video, one image that's going to radicalize an individual. It's this repeated access to this content that slowly over time radicalizes them and changes their views. Next. And so going off of that, there are some more examples of a chat space where I actually found someone who reported to be in high school under 18 years old. And the fact that he was already so involved in these different groups and movements that individuals were trying to basically help him find a group to belong to. And so the people that are you know, over 18 and running these groups, they see the importance of the youth. And so while there might be one group that doesn't allow for individuals under 18, as you can see here, they have no problem kind of directing them towards other groups that are okay with people under 18 as well. Thank you. Here's one of the slides that we, when we're talking about difficult slides to see, here is definitely one of the, uh, an example of that. Um, to piggyback on what Cal has been talking about, know that when we put up slides like these and the others you'll be seeing today, we only do so when there is an educational purpose. When we talk to young people about what we're seeing, we minimize the name of groups and we minimize the use of images. These slides come from some local uh, Chicago area schools. The one on the left-hand side was at a local Chicago area high school. In response, the school held an assembly, a tolerance assembly, that was their term. During the assembly, somebody airdropped. Uh, there's the image with the swastika with the term airdrop. Somebody airdropped all the participants this image of the swastika. So these are disturbing uh, events. We know that are, as kids are moving from grade level to grade level, they are coming to each grade level already having been exposed to some extent, whether or not they recognize it, uh, to white supremacist activity, behaviors, or ideology. One of the things that we are recognizing is that the groups that are beginning to recruit have a real sophisticated understanding of youth development. And uh, Danielle is gonna talk about that more a little bit later. They recognize that the best way of meeting youth where they are is to do it in the spaces in which they exist. That's often the online space. So we'll talk a bit about that today. So going forward with that vulnerability to extremism, we know a lot about adolescent development. We know that there are cognitive changes that happen for children from ages 10 to 13, 13 to 17, and so forth from there. Those cognitive changes can include developing advanced reasoning skills. Teenagers will start to create some abstract thinking skills, thinking about things that aren't seen, heard, or touched, but about ideas, about feelings. What are their values? What is meaningful to them? Who am I? And as those cognitive changes start to happen, people try and find a sense of belonging. 
We also see, and I wasn't a teenager too, too long ago, and there may be, may, may be some teenagers in the room, but also all of us have once been teenagers. And we know that that desire for risk and thrill seeking and pushing boundaries is very appropriate developmentally in adolescence. It's a time when young people are learning to make the choices for themselves. They're learning about and trying on new identities and personality traits, and that may lead to some risky behaviors. In fact, there's a developmental need to engage in some risky behavior. So this is that time that the brain starts to perceive reward from risk more easily, and it's more easily stimulated. So we see that, especially online, as the desire for finding community, building conversation with others, making friends online, getting likes on TikTok or on Instagram, getting um, as many people to communicate with as they can. And that takes us right into developing those peer groups. The pandemic made it really difficult for a lot of children, a lot of adolescents to find friends and spend time with their friends. So they turned to the internet. It's a time when there's a huge shift from family to peers during that adolescent development. And social acceptance by peers triggers a more positive response than it does from parents. That's just the unfortunate reality of it, but one that we need to make sure we understand. And then finally, there's, like I said, that need for belonging. Everyone wants to belong, but teenagers specifically. It's a time when you want to be treated with respect, time between childhood and adulthood where you don't want to be belittled, but you want to be taken seriously. And these extremist groups understand that. While it's important for educators and parents to understand adolescent development, it's something that people online can also take advantage of. They know how to create that sense of belonging. They know that we're looking for the risk, that opportunity to push boundaries, and they understand those cognitive changes as well. So that's something that makes adolescents even more vulnerable. We spend a lot of time talking to educators about the things that they're seeing in the schools, uh, the things that their kids are confronting and, and having to combat. One of, the, uh, one of the messages that we at ADL are pushing against is a uh, sort of common phrase or saying, educators will say, oh, my kids are experimenting with this sign or this symbol or this phrase, it must be coming from the home. So at ADL and with this webinar today, we wanna to push back against that. Often, family members do not know what their kids are seeing online. Very often, kids wouldn't necessarily define what they are seeing online as hate speech. So we wanna talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. The other thing to recognize is that there is not an identifiable profile of a kid who is vulnerable to these things. Unfortunately, and we'll talk a little bit more about that today, every kid is vulnerable. In the 1970s, 1980s, we used to talk a lot about a disaffected youth, um, anti-authoritarian personality. Those are no longer terms that are fully in operation. The other thing that we want to note is a lot of the signs and symbols that we're seeing are moving from the traditionally recognizable to coded uh, signs and symbols. There is a mainstreaming of this particular ideology that we need to be cognizant of. So here are some examples. There's a frequent use of coded symbols, uh, code words, dog whistle, some of these that we've got up on the screen right now may be familiar to some of you. Some of them may not be familiar. The one of the coat of arms with the hairstyle is the hair of Dylan Roof, who shot up the AME church. 8-8, eight, eight, that's the eighth letter of the alphabet. Uh, so H-H, Heil Hitler. White supremacists will often talk about red pilling. For any of you who have seen The Matrix, that may be a term that is familiar to you. In this case, white supremacists are using it to talk about being, quote, woke to white supremacist ideology. This kind of code language is exciting to kids. It's a secret language, something that they may know about, they can circulate, their educators won't recognize. So one of the things that we do in our education programs is to work with educators to help them understand the evolution of signs and symbols that white supremacists are beginning to use. Groups will also use these as code to send messages to one another. And I think Laura made a very good point on the idea of evolution. Um, so these are two symbols here. The symbol on the left is actually what was used by the Hitler Youth Organization during the Third Reich. And so you can see using the diamond with the red and white and then with the swastika in the center. 
Now, when we look to the right, this is a modern white supremacist group that is specifically youth focused. And so you can see they kind of start to blend some of the symbols together. And so by taking the swastika off, they're able to blend it. And so it doesn't look that is inherently as extremist because the swastika is very easily recognizable. And instead, blending it with um, what you can make out is the background of the Germans' Third Reich uh, flag. And then there is the diamond, um, which is in the forefront of a Zonenrad, which is another neo-Nazi symbol that isn't quite as well known as the swastika. And so this is something very common where they'll take kind of little pieces and bits from historical symbolism and try to create their own symbols for their new groups as well. Again, as Laura said, creating dog whistles and code words so that they're able to connect with one another and they understand that each other has the same beliefs while also not tipping off um, non-extremist individuals at the same time. As Danielle indicated, um, some of these groups are operating with great sophistication and a very thoughtful understanding, and I say that intentionally, thoughtful understanding of youth development and psychology. So as Danielle indicated, they are working off our young people's need to feel like they belong, to feel like they have multiple friends. And we now know that our young people today talk about friendship in a way that we perhaps as adults did not. You're collecting friends or likes online. So they understand uh, it's part of their recruitment tactic that the more uh, exciting they can make their memes, the more even provocative they might uh, sort of make their statements, the more likes, the more friends the kids may get. They're also working on the notion that kids are inspired and excited by competition. So for instance, I'll give you one example. We have one well-known player, his name is Casey. He is a competitor in the gaming space. He's got lots and lots of followers. Kids like to follow him. They feel honored when he follows them. What he will do is intersperse the game with uh, words of, of wisdom, so to speak. And again, I use that in quotation marks. So he becomes a pundit for white supremacist ideology and thought. But the kids are already drawn into the game. So they are, by extension, drawn to him. They will also use in their uh, postings childish imagery, animated ninjas, ice cream cones, stuff to follow up on what Cal has said, stuff that makes the imagery seem less threatening and not in fact transgressive at all. And here's where we come to the point where kids are no longer equipped to see what they are posting as hateful in its uh, makeup. Daniel Kelly, who is one of our, uh, one of the, the, our main folks working in our Center on Technology and Society does a lot of work with algorithmic bias, uh, with amplification within gaming sites has said this, on the road to radicalization, there are spaces where kids can be inoculated to the fact that hate, specifically against people based on their identity, is not a transgressive thing. I think that's really key. We want to understand that when we talk to our kids, they may, in, in part because of the proliferation through algorithms of hate sites, no longer be in a world where what they are seeing is hate. Here's some other tactics that we want to point out. Um, in the name of making hate less transgressive, one of the things that white supremacist groups will do and, and white supremacist individuals will do is to repeat over and over and over again the same image so that it becomes, in effect, a normalized image. They will also adopt fun cultural memes, tweak them and change them just a bit so that the language, again, doesn't seem hateful in nature. One of the coded symbols that we see frequently is what we call the echo. That's that three parentheses. If you put a word inside those parentheses, what it is designed to do is to indicate the word Jew. So you can, for instance, have Jane in there. It's indicating Jane is Jewish. You can have um, the word, say, director of education in there. That's designed to indicate that that director is Jewish. So here's another way in which they begin to normalize hate. There are other tactics. One, using humor. We often hear our kids say things like, oh, it's just a joke. I didn't mean anything by it. Well, here's one of the spaces in which uh, that 
logic comes into play. Here's for those of you whose kids are on Fortnite, here's one image from Fortnite. We also know that chat rooms are being frequently used. We used to talk a lot about sexual predators in chat rooms. We're now saying we've got to be aware of the kind of recruitment that is going on in chat rooms in games like Fortnite. Here is, again, a directive mandate by white supremacist, one white supremacist individual, the tone of the site should be light. We put this quote up here simply to indicate that the groups that are recruiting understand what they are doing. And so this really extends not just from white supremacists, maybe on more mainstream platforms, but also on their extremist platforms as well. Um, these are all pieces of content that have been shared on actual extremist platforms, but have a very different tone and a much more youthful tone. Um, a big thing is, you know, these different color palettes they'll use. So if you see the image on the left, this kind of filter on it is very popular with younger groups, especially people who are involved in a type of music and aesthetic called vaporwave, kind of trying to, you know, hearken to an idea of nostalgia. But what they'll do is using that more similar and simple safe image and injecting their white supremacist ideals into it. And so that youthful individuals are not immediately put off by the imagery itself. And so then they read the content and that's what kind of slowly brings them into that space. Um, the same goes on the far right. You know, that looks like a very standard, almost like a perfume commercial. It's got the really cool saturated lighting. Um, again, you know, expressing like purples and pinks, which are very common, but when you read the actual label, you'll see one, the SS bolts of the uh, Schutzstaffel, which was a, para a military group in Hitler's uh, Third Reich, and then you see the description, anti-Semitism, consumed daily, and then below that, the 88, which is another symbol that Lara had talked about before. And then when that comes to the real world, you see in the center, this was from a rally in New Jersey, um, and this is actually another flag for the group that I mentioned previously. So again, you can see them interpreting different symbols into the original Hitler Youth symbol. Um, and so this is something that is not just seen, you know, in mainstream places to pull people into extremist places. It's also in the extremist places and in the real world as well. I can move to the next slide. Um, and when they get to these other spaces, it's not just the symbolism. But immediately they're going to be inundated with, you know, conspiracy theories and really alternate histories. Um, this post here is one of a series that a group has done for most of the United States, um, and they provide one for each city, uh, each state, sorry, where they're essentially providing an alternate white supremacist history of each state. Um, this one here being for Texas. Um, and most of them will talk about either certain events and what they see as white history in the state, and then talking about why this history must be preserved against their perceived enemies, whether that be Jews or certain minority groups, or more recently, the uh, LGBTQ plus community as well. Next slide. And then um, finally, just again, going on with the symbolism is, and there's what that means when they start trying to pull individuals into activism. Um, and you see all these examples here. So on the bottom, there is an event that uh, was being held by um, a far right group and they try to make it look like, you know, this looks like a summer music festival. Um, or for example, the White Lives Matter official checklist. This is a page that you can easily find on their web, on their um, extremist spaces. And it gives individuals new to the group, whether adults or youth, a literal checklist on what to do essentially to become a member of the group. Um, and then for the last example on the far right and the top, these are different pieces of real world propaganda by the group Patriot Front. Patriot Front that is, is a group that has had extensive radicalization of youths. Um, the majority of the, their members are also youths. And so when we look at the imagery here, we can see very kind of generic ideas, United We Stand, Reject Poison, and then the website. So again, using these sorts of more simpler um, to digest symbolism, to pull them into the spaces where they can then be further um, introduced to white supremacist content. Just leave that slide, Danielle, up for one quick moment, follow up on some of the things that Cal has been talking about. We know uh, two things. One, that our kids, young people, are looking to develop what we would call social competency skills. 
These are not the skills on the screen that we want them to develop, but they are, are developing and, and building what they're talking to young people about based on those same notions. So, hey, we wanna set an example by convincing others to get off the computer. Here are some activities the kids can do. You'll recognize that kind of language and directive from the sites that we do want our kids to be on. Here's a very, to Cal's point, a very concrete list of things that kids can do to be activists. We might in fact put out a similar list with different sorts of activities. So it's drawing and our kids need to develop those social competency skills to be part of communities. The other thing is our kids are soaking up knowledge. Um, so the slide before that we put up, that's about developing the ability to be a researcher. I had one group of high school students uh, we were working with that had developed an incredibly sophisticated white website it was a white supremacist website in, in its ideology and its call to action, traced what it was doing to the British Union of fascists, not Nazis, Nazi so, uh, National Socialism in Germany, the Third Reich, but rather the British Union of fascists. That took an enormous amount of capability, ability, um, adeptness with historical research to be able to create that legacy. So we want to make sure that we're giving our kids counter knowledge. All right, we can go to the next slide. So one of the spaces where, again, we know that a lot of the recruitment is operating is in the online gaming space, multiplayer games, for instance. Just wanted to throw up a couple of stats. Here we have 71% of American kids under 18 are playing video games. We've interviewed a number of kids who do play video games. We have to work against any older notion of games as the purview of the boys in the basement. Everybody, every identity group, every um, all genders are playing video games today. So let's take a look at some of the things that we're tracking. Here's an interview that we did with adult gamers, so from 18 to 45, and it tracks closely with what we're seeing in our youth populations exposure to white supremacist ideas. You'll see in 2020, we had about 9% report exposure to white supremacist ideologies. 2021, it decreased slightly, 1%. 2022, we saw a report of 20% saying that they had been exposed. One of the things that I'm struck by in terms of these stats is in order to be able to report exposure, they have to be able to articulate or understand what white supremacist ideology or behavior actually is. Now let's look at some of the stats. For our young people here, we're looking at reported incidents of exposure from the ages of 10 to 17. 15% of that group said that they had been exposed in 2022 to what we would call white supremacist ideology or behavior. We see that about 16% of the total said that they were exposed through an online video game. 25, now 26%, um, said that they had been exposed on social media writ large. And it's not all bad. So we're going to take a moment. And we see here on the left-hand side in the world of Warcraft, there was a sit-in protest against gender-based harassment that was happening not only within the World of Warcraft universe, but in the gaming industry as a whole. So a lot of players came together and had a sit-in protest within the game. So that way they're able to bring all of their communities that they've developed within the game together to do this. And then we know the infamous Ariana Grande live concert in Fortnite that was attended by over 1 million people globally. An opportunity to find joy, community, participation in a positive way. So as we move forward into our frequently asked questions, we're going to take a second and Lara loves to do this in all of her webinars. You have a lot of heavy information. Go get some ice cream, get yourself a treat after this. We have about 21 minutes to go in the webinar. We understand that this gives people a lot to think about. You'll have some resources to follow up at the end. And as we go through these frequently asked questions, feel free to take notes and a recording will be sent out after as well. So I will also invite all of you to take a big deep breath before we continue on with those frequently asked questions. So I'm gonna inhale and exhale. Shake it out a little bit. It's hard to hear. It's hard to know what kids, ch children, adults, our friends, our students can possibly be exposed to online, but we're so grateful for the research to help us understand how to combat that. 
So for the last section of our webinar today, we wanted to get into some frequently asked questions, questions that come to us from educators, from parents, from local groups. And the first one we see here is, how can I tell if my child is being exposed to extremist content? Cal and Laura, take it away. One of the things that we, when we talk to our educators, what we ask them to look, to look for are um, scribbles in their notebooks. Maybe they're using certain logos or some of the codes that we put up on the screen. Um, repeated phrases, changes in the kind of phrasing that they're using to talk about things that you may have been talking about in your classroom. So for instance, if you did a unit on immigration, they start using the phrase instead of documented or undocumented, they start talking about illegal aliens. So a turn of phrase that is coming from the kind of rhetoric that we're seeing in some of these white supremacist sites. They may begin to test out comments with their friends. They may demonstrate a, a new fascination with guns or the history of war or um, Hitler, for instance. So those are some of the things that we begin to say, drawings, we begin to say to our educators and to our family members, hey, pay attention to that. It may not mean that they are affiliating themselves with an ideology or a particular group or individuals, but it is something to begin to talk to your kids about. And I think that's a really good point circling back to what we talked about at the beginning of our presentation was the pyramid of hate. When you start to see them, you know, stereotyping certain groups, as Lara had said, you know, not calling them documented or undocumented immigrants, but calling them illegal immigrants, or making certain, you know, offensive remarks that are lighter, they're not going to be, you know, directly like racially motiv motivated remarks, but they might just be certain, you know, words or terms that you are kind of wondering where they might have got this from. They could say, you know, oh, well, it's, you know, jokes between our friends. I think that's another, you know, big hallmark is, as we talked about, a lot of this content is proposed to our children as humor. And so kind of seeing what that sense of humor is in, your, in our children and see when it starts to kind of jump into a space where it leans more into stereotyping, like it's in the pyramid of hate, or leans more into, you know, creating in-groups and out-groups. Those are the sort of things that I would be looking for. Thank you. Danielle, um, what are the kind of things, I know that you talk to family members all the time about this, what are the kind of things that you advise family members or teachers to be asking their kids? So for this, we came up with a set of question stems and messaging stems to help parents. So this is where you might wanna take some notes, but I'll just go through a few of these. So first, what are your friends talking about online? Asking your child at home or students in your classroom if you start to hear some concerning phrases, words, some, see some concerning behaviors. What are you talking about online? Are you talking about your identity? Are you sharing information about who you are? Are you seeking for connection online? Next is, why do people find blank funny? So if you see a repeated, you know, that memification of hate, if you see something continue to come up or you see a group of students huddling around something, why is that funny? What's funny about that? Regularly in our instant response in our reporting, we see that a lot of the time students don't understand that what they are laughing at is causing a lot of harm. There's an impact versus intent issue going on there. So having that conversation, opening that line as well. A couple other pieces here. Have you heard about these extremist groups? Do you see people being bullied online on social media or in games? The majority of students, some of our reports say, upwards of 84%, are seeing hate online in some way, and they don't know how to respond. They also can gain some social traction by taking a screenshot and passing it on. So talking to your child about what is what does that look like? What does that sound like? Do you know how to intervene and stop it? And the next, do you talk to people online you haven't confirmed in person or on private servers? So that's specifically targeting the, um, the website Discord. Those private servers is something a student might be or a child could be invited to, and they might not know any of those people. And, in real life, and they've just made a connection playing in a game. And that's really, um, those, those private servers 
are not being tracked. We're not seeing exactly what is happening, what the conversations are. It's really hard to understand what your child might be exposed to in those private servers. And then what do you share online? If your child is sharing about their identity, maybe they are a Jewish male student or they are a female middle schooler. If they're sharing that information, how could a group capitalize on learning more about that? Or how could that child become a target as well? And then just the last two, how does posting online make you feel? Are they getting a huge serotonin boost? Are they depending too much on their online presence throughout their day that they're not connecting with others in the real world? Because then they're starting to maybe self-isolate and we start to see some of those other red flags with students. And what do you find exciting about a certain platform? Because if that becomes problematic, can we find another platform to replace it? just add to that, Danielle, and here I'll speak as a parent, that I know if we, if I were to see my kid um, disseminating any of the information that we've talked about today, I'd be horrified. My first impulse would be to go to my child and go, oh, what do you say? Oh my gosh, this is awful. Da, 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 da. Remember that you are on the same team as your child. And I think that's why these questions are so useful and why we said early on, that it's important to take a breath with, with what you're seeing and do whatever emotional work you need to do, whatever research work you need to do to prepare yourself for your conversation with the young people in your life. The other thing that I will say is we always at ADL emphasize the importance of talking with your young people. Here's an example of why that's so important. I was working with a school with a group of students at one point, they'd been doing a culture day, a group of Jewish students had been talking about their Jewish heritage, Kid came over to them and did a Heil Hitler salute and started talking about how much he liked Hitler. Well, in talking to the child, we recognized that the kid was really interested in Jewish culture, really interested in Jewish identity, but the only thing he had ever learned about Jews had to do with the um, Holocaust. Those were the only books he had ever read. He'd only read things about war and genocide. And so in his attempt to bond, it was a real perverted attempt to bond, but that's actually what he was trying to do. So we needed to talk to him and to talk with his family members and to help him understand how harmful, again, to Danielle's point about impact, how harmful uh, what he had done, the impact of what he had done and how harmful it was. Perfect. Thank you for adding that, Laura. And these questions all came from our own research within some of our own resources and talking with parents as well about what conversations have been successful at home. Okay, so this question is for both Danielle and Laura, and I think it's a very important one, but basically, is every child vulnerable? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so we'll go into that just a little bit more. Um, the first piece is we have here the radicalization spectrum. So you see as it goes from a child, an adult, a person being vulnerable to being activated. So in that vulnerability space, you see maybe they're isolated. They're becoming more alienated. They talk about not having friends or not having a community. Oftentimes that vulnerability is rooted in shame. Something happened that embarrassed them and they turned inward or they turned online. Next, as we get into ideological, you'll see those behavior and attitude changes. Maybe as Laura mentioned previously, drawing those hate symbols, scribbling in notebooks, using inappropriate language or hateful language. Then you get into motivated, planning and activated. And I'll give you all a second just to read that before we continue on. Laura, I wanna make that connection there to the behavior. Of course. Um, so again, we put up that last slide with a caveat that vulnerable does not equal radicalized, that somebody who is espousing ideology or drawing those hate symbols on their notebooks does not mean that they are actually beginning to engage in violent extremist behavior or action. Here's another spectrum that we frequently use. We talk about somebody who is beginning to engage in ideology, so espousing some rhetoric moving into their motivation. They're beginning to um, feel motivated or, or believe in the reasons to begin to act. They're starting to plan and they are finally activated. So these are the things that we do look for. Um, again, this does not constitute legal advice. If you are concerned about any potential behavior, Please bring your social workers, your counselors, your families, um, perhaps law enforcement into conversation with you. 
Now, here's some things to look for when we're talking about identifying the shift from ideology to behavior. One of the things you might want to attend to are expressions of certainty. So for instance, words like something has to be done. We have no choice but to act. We need to do X, Y, and Z. And then attach to that phrase, the rhetoric of the white supremacist groups that we've been discussing. Uh, we need to get rid of all of the legal aliens, for instance. Urgency. The time is now. Uh, there's an imminent threat. White people are being, are being eliminated, for instance. Rise up before it's too late. Things are enormous in their minds. So you may see, again, references to things like genocide, government infiltration, again, mimicking or parroting the things that they have heard online and already been exposed to. Again, none of this constitutes in itself adherence to a white supremacist group, but it is something to pay attention to. So <laughs> said that there's a lot of stuff going on online, but as Danielle indicated earlier, there's a lot of good stuff online. Uh, that's something that my own child reminds me of frequently. So Danielle, what websites can my kids use? So there's a long list of apps, of websites, of games, whether you're a teacher and you're using Google Classroom or Dreambox, if you are a parent and you see that your child is on Discord or TikTok, there's a new website and a new app every day. So rather than giving you a list of what websites can my kids use, we want to give you some tools for how can I make sure that the websites my child is using, they're using them safely. So before we go into some specifics there, two websites that are not ADL resources, but that we recommend to parents and families as well are Common Sense Media and PBS Learning Media. Common Sense Media provides rankings of movies, of video games, of apps for parents, and they give replacement app options for parents to see for, a, for children as young as three, upwards to 18. And on PBS Learning Media, they have an entire library full of, lead, of media literacy resources that are geared towards students for teachers to use that are completely free that we invite you to explore as well. But how do I talk to young people? How do I talk to students in my classroom or my children at home? First, learn as much as you can. When you know that your child is getting really into a new game, ask questions, learn about the dark corners of that game, but also understand how are people using this? How are they interacting? What is the language I need to know when I'm asking those questions? For example, on Discord, I wouldn't have known what a private server was if I didn't do my own research first. Next, be curious and ask questions. We gave you some of those messaging stems already. Don't judge. As we also stated a few minutes ago, within that radicalization spectrum, shame really can help force people to turn inward. Don't judge and understand that by somebody be being vulnerable with you, a child being vulnerable and saying, I think I might be in trouble or something might be happening or I saw this or I made a mistake, allow them to stop and meet them where they're at. If you are a teacher, share your concerns with your administrators and with the parents as well. We want to make sure that all of those doors and conversations are open. And if you're a parent and you're concerned, you can reach out to us to get more tools and resources. You can talk to the, um, you can talk to counselors at your child's school, talk to administrators, share those concerns so you're not just having a conversation with yourself about what that looks like. Next, discuss misinformation and media literacy. It is really important. We talked about media literacy years ago in a very different way, but now with the way that the internet moves so quickly, it's really important for kids to be able to identify what's real and what's fake. And those PBS learning media, or excuse me, um, PBS literacy courses allow for ch children to learn more about those specific media literacy skills. Valuing people's differences and diversity. If the first time somebody learns about someone unlike them is through the lens of hate, it's going to be there. That might be what they continue to believe. But if instead you're valuing people that are different than who you are in your home, if you're allowing them to be exposed to different religions, different races, different cultural norms, then the first time they experience that won't be in a hateful chat room online. And finally, keeping that door open. This goes for all caregivers, for all children. It's being that trusted adult means the world for a child to be able to turn to and know that they're going to have resources and that they'll forgive them if they make mistakes before they end up in a place where they've 
acted out in a violent manner or in a way that they may, may later regret. All right, we're gonna turn it over to Jillian with some quick questions before we wrap things up. All right, I'm gonna put some resources in the chat because we believe in learning all day long here at the ADL. So if you need additional resources to continue your learning on this topic, um, please copy and paste um, this link in the chat into your browser so you can reference it later. We had some great questions come in from the chat today and I wanted to, in the last six minutes here, get to a couple of them. Um, I think this first one is for Callum. The question is, do we find that content platforms, specifically Twitch, Reddit, 4chan, et cetera, are not really per policing their content spaces? Have they done anything to stem the tide um, or are they largely washing their hands of content moderation? So that's gonna be very dependent on the platform. Um, I mean, some of the names I heard there are better than others. Um, obviously, you're going to have platforms like 4chan that prides itself specifically on not moderating their content. So in a space like that, there will be about zero content moderation. But, you know, looking at other platforms, um, we have seen efforts made to work on it. And with uh, the ADL and our Center on Technology and Society, we actually do work with a lot of these platforms in lockstep and helping to educate them on what we're seeing so that they're able to better, you know, adjust their, their systems to um, work against, you know, to work against this content being on their platforms. But it's very, like I said, platform to platform. Okay. That makes sense. It depends. It depends on what platform you're using. And there is a lot of them out there. Um, this question, I can start with Laura and then Laura, you can throw it to um, Danielle. What can I say to my son when he, a Jewish uh, male, and his friend um, who is Black in a mostly Christian community joke about their own identity using stereotypes they don't believe? They use comedy to connect over their differences. Advice as an educator, as a parent, uh, any, any, as an ADL employee, all of the above. Yeah. One of the things that um, we do in my home and, and with the work that we're doing with educators is we talk to everybody about normalizing talk. So one of the things I would begin to do is I would take my child aside and maybe with my child's friend and ask them, why are they using these particular terms or stereotypes? Do they understand some of the history? What's going on? What's at the root of their need to engage in this particular kind of humor? I, I think um, rather than go to best practices right away, I'd want to find out what's going on with my particular kid because inevitably there's more there. Uh, it's about belonging. It's about not feeling like they are part of a community. Then we can also talk about what it means to be a uh small group within a much larger community and, and how we um, how we operate with our identities. I would also not be surprised when traumas happen that kids will say things like, oh, I wish I wasn't Jewish or I wish I wasn't Black. Um, they don't want to be part of the community that's being targeted. And I think that's one of the things that's going on when kids use that kind of humor. And just to quickly add on, um, having the language of intent versus impact is really important in those conversations. The intention might be connection, it might be joking, it might be silly and fun, but the impact is there are other ears around and you don't want to perpetuate those stereotypes among people that are of similar identities or of different identities because you just don't know who else is listening and who else might be harmed or influenced by those jokes and comments. I think that's it for questions from the chat. Any final thoughts as we close out? Cool. Yeah, I do, I do yeah. want to say just one thing. I mean, I think as we've indicated in this presentation today, our kids have lots of access to hate rhetoric, to tools to perpetuate hate. And one of our jobs as educators, as family members, is to equip our kids with the skills to counter those messages. Just a quick example. Uh, when I talk to my child about what they're seeing, I talk to them about the strategies that they can use to respond if a friend is using any of this language. It's about helping them to operate not in a time of crisis, but um, in, in, with a foundation of uh, 
preparedness so that they know how to respond in a moment and they are not having to think on their feet when something is tossed their way. Perfect. Thank you. And just as we quickly close, just to plug a couple of ADL resources before we um, wrap things up today, we have our No Place for Hate program that is a K-12 anti-bullying, anti-bias, anti-hate program that's available across the nation for schools to engage with that haps, that allows these conversations to happen organically among students and to meet those needs of what types of hate, what types of bias are we seeing in our own communities and our World of Difference Institute, which is geared specifically towards educators to work on, as we stated before, working on that individual reflection piece and those individual biases. More resources will be shared afterwards, um, but just on behalf of ADL, we want to thank you all for joining us today, and thank you so much to my co-guides, Callum and Lara. Your expertise is something I am so, so grateful for. <laughs>